Good morning. It's time to conclude another series. Just seems like we say that every week. I know there's like six weeks or eight weeks in between them and eight in this, in this situation. Uh, time just flies when we're having fun, I guess, as they say. And I think this has been fun as we've looked at the kingdom, uh, parables, stories made up by Jesus, uh, earthly stories about seeds and treasures and things we fully understand uh, to illustrate spiritual or heavenly truths. And Jesus had to do this because the religious leaders of the time were not looking for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven that was arriving. They were looking for a restoration of the kingdom that they remembered. You know, Saul and David and Solomon and the mightiest country in the world, let's get Rome out of here and do this thing. Uh, And that's not what's going to happen. Jesus didn't ride into town on a white horse. (laughs) Came in as a little baby. And they weren't taking over the Roman Empire. It was something much Different, But Jesus had said, as I've said a couple of times, the kingdom of heaven is here. And the second week I shared this line from the Life Application Bible. The kingdom of heaven is not a geographic location in the west side of Lansing, but a spiritual realm where God rules and where believers share in his eternal life. We're part of forever right now. We join that kingdom when we trust in Christ as Savior. It would be really weird if you accepted Christ and disappeared. Where did Aaron go? Oh, he accepted Christ yesterday. (laughs) That's not the way it works. The kingdom of heaven is among us because it is us. And God has incredible plans for us if we're willing to dive in and do them. We've said that in several different ways through this entire series. So as I look about where we've been, uh, four of our seven weeks, we're in Matthew chapter 13. So we can say it's the kingdom or parable series, but as is always the case there, we're really just preaching from the Bible. And it's been mostly in uh, four of those weeks in chapter 13, covering five of the parables that Jesus told there. Uh, We also had a week in chapter 18, a week in chapter 20, and a week in chapter 25, which emphasizes Jesus told these parables all the time. It's a a go-to way to teach, to kind of get people's attention, but make you kind of dig in a little bit and figure out what he's really talking about. Uh, So I looked at what was left. There's two left in chapter 13. And and our original list Chase put together, I just said the last week, Trent, pick one you want. and says, look here, one's the yeast. And I I don't cook, unless you're picking pizza up. (laughs) Or peanut butter and jelly. Grilled peanut butter and jelly, I can do. A grilled cheese. I can do I can do those. So come on over sometime. I'll grill you up one. Uh, otherwise, I don't. But it's, it's still a, a cool pair because it says just like yeast goes through the, bakes into the entire hunk of dough, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven permeates, the word in the NLT, everything around it. That's a, that's a cool snapshot. And I thought, yeah, that, that'd preach. You know, talk about all the ways we can influence our world. Uh, but I decided not to. And at the end of the chapter, end of chapter 13, there's the fishing net parable where Jesus says, you throw the net out, bring all the fish up to shore and throw the good ones and take them to the fish market, throw the bad ones away. And he says, just like that in the last days, the wicked will be separated from the righteous and there'll be firing furnace and na- weeping and gnashing of teeth. So as we have said at least twice, I think Chase may have touched on it once, I know my two sermons back to the parable of the wheat and the weeds and the parable of the talents two weeks ago, the, the last, the, one of the points is there will be a judgment. So I said, do I want to preach that again for a whole other Sunday? I'm getting a little tired of that. So I'll just repeat, chapter 13 does say there'll be a judgment. I think I've said that enough. So I looked a little farther. There's, there's more parables. Uh, chapter 18 has, um, uh, yeah, 18 has the lost sheep. That's a good one. Indeed, every single life matters. Go after that one lost sheep. I actually love it in the Gospel of Luke. It's extended into the lost coin and the lost son. My very favorite parable in the entire Bible. So that was tempting. And then there's chapter 21, the evil farmers. Evil farmers, the story about the rejection of Jesus. We certainly see some people literally reject Jesus today. It's probably worth talking about. 22 is a great feast that the people, the religious leaders, clearly Jesus was talking to, didn't come to the feast, even though they're invited. So they invite everybody else. And the gospel is truly available to everyone. And by the time Jesus actually died, rose again, and set the disciples out to do ministry, 
extended to Paul, and he took that message to the entire Gentile empire that the gospel is available to everyone. And then the 10 bridesmaids in the 25, Jesus is coming back. You need to be ready. So, man, those are all really good messages. I go, you know, which, which one of those should I pick? Which one's a good, a good one to do? But none of them seemed to conclude the series for me. There was one more. It's true in five verses. It's the parable of the two sons, not the prodigal son and the older brother. That's another story of two sons I already mentioned. This is just says in your Bible, parable of the two sons. Before I read it, let me give you the context. That's going to be our closing parable. Uh, in this chapter, the chapter starts with the triumphal entry. After three years of ministry, Jesus sits on a little donkey comes into town. They're throwing palm branches down. They're saying, Hosanna, king of the Jews. Big celebration. Then Jesus goes and clears the temple. Whole other side story, but it had gotten kind of corrupt. Money exchangers selling animals they need for sacrifices at too high of, just corrupt. And it, right in the temple courtyard, Jesus said, get out of here, you guys. So, or something like that. That's my paraphrase. He said something. He, he got rid of them anyway. So the religious leaders come up next in the chapter, and say, by whose authority do you do these things? Kind of like, Jesus, who do you think you are kicking the money changers out? We get, a, we get 10% of that. I didn't know what they did or not. And Jesus says, well, before I answer that, you answer a question for me. By whose authority did John, John the Baptist, baptize? <laughs> they all held it up over the side. He goes, um, hmm. If we say John baptized by heavenly authority, he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? If we say John baptized just by his own human authority, the people are going to riot because they all thought John was a prophet. I think he's got us. This happened all the time. You think the guys would give up? I got it. <clears throat> uh, we don't know. <laughs> you find, find it right in the chapter. <laughs> then Jesus says, well, I'm not going to tell you either then. A, he, he saw their game, and there, there is deep humor in that. That Jesus went to say, oh, they're attacking my authority. No, he, he just kind of asked them a question they could answer. He goes, I'm not going to answer your question either, but think about this. So I think it's very significant that that's the context of this parable. He goes, think about this. But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. Never heard your child say that. <laughs> but later he changed his mind and went anyway. Hmm. Then the father told the other son, you go, because the first one said he won. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. <laughs> Your kids didn't have done that either. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, the religious leaders that just got stumped, the first. So they got it. Or did they? Does that make sense? Let's go. Wait, 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 wait a minute. The first? I mean, stay, stay there for a second. I'm going to read that again. Go back to the text, sorry. <laughs> nope, not there. The, the actual story of the son. Parable of two sons. Yay! A man with two sons told the other boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. They replied, that was the obedient one? Does that sound obedient to you? Nope, I won't go. That's the obedient son. The one that said, yes, sir, I will was not the obedient one. That sounds obedient to me. But why is that not true? Because what you actually do is much more important than what you say you're going to do. Lesson number one and the big one of the day. The obedient one is one that actually changed his mind and went anyway. Jesus explains it. He says it this way. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. Wow, he went all in. That's not the cream of the crop. 
Tax collectors hated because everyone knew they corruptly overcharged and kept the difference themselves. They were actually Jewish people hired by the Roman government to collect the tax. They knew who was making the money, and they were licensed to collect whatever they wanted. And Jesus pointed them out in the story as good people and prostitutes, not exactly the morally most positive. That's two he named. He says, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you, religious leaders. Huddle up and talk about that for a second. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. While tax collectors and prostitutes did, they've let God change their lives. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe and repent of your sins. Quick, short little parable. So I'm going to focus on one line of it in a second. But just the overriding principles, again, the key one, the big one, is what we actually do is more important than what we're saying. We're going to go ahead and to the next slide. What we say, what we actually do is more important than what we say we are going to do. We can take that lesson into this week easily. We have a lot of great intentions. I really should. I really could. I think I would. All those sentences, you haven't done anything yet <laughs> until you go, I will. So what we actually do is more important than what we say we're going to do. The right way to live was written in the text. There is a right way to live, and you can choose it or you can resist it. Older son thought twice, actually did the right thing. The younger son had the, the, younger son had the, or the other son had the good intentions, never did it. There's a right way to live, and you can choose it or you can resist it. Thirdly, people who resist the gospel may actually be closer to accepting it than those who are very familiar with it. Think about that for a second. I, I stole this sentence, and it was long, so I, I always try to edit down, but I couldn't. So read the whole thing again with me. People who resist the gospel may actually be closer to accepting it than those who are very familiar with it. Churches are full of people today that randomly just kind of show up because that's what they do. And it probably doesn't cross their mind, not all people, obviously, but many people, may not cross their mind again until next Sunday morning. Then there's people that say they could care less. What this, I think, parable teaches is they may be more interested than you think. The tax collectors and prostitutes turned to the truth of the gospel when it was explained to them. So we always encourage leaders in our campus life clubs, in our high school ministry, student leaders, to not decide for someone else if they're interested, because that's the temptation. We go, oh, Colin, he, he'll never come. You know, he, once he said, you know, we, we decide who they are and what their interest in the gospel is. We don't know totally who they are or what their interest is. We should assume the best and go, hey, you want to come again? And for the 19th time, we say, nope. We have no idea what happens in his life this week. This might the week he, he actually comes up because you've asked and say, hey, Camp's Life's Tuesday, right? I'm thinking about coming this week. And as soon as like that, all three years, I've said, sure you are. <laughs> I've heard that before. You know, just, just joking. Again, not forcing either way. But the door should always be open, not closed by me saying, no, they'll never be interested. We choose for people. And the reality is, People that you think are totally resistant might be closer to the gospel than people that you think are goody goodies or whatever else. So let's not decide for people. Let's give everyone the opportunity to be invited to hear the gospel. It might take 10 times, it might take 20 times. It doesn't matter how many times it takes. We want them to try. We want them to sit here some Sunday and hear the story because you have invited them. So this is basic background, but what I want to do is uh, review the parables we've done so far before we close out this parable. So this is kind of fun to be able to do that. In a long series like this, we can't always do this, but I thought I could do it quick. So this is where we have been. Parable number one, the parable of the soils. People respond differently because they are in different states of readiness, what we just talked about. Don't decide for them. Some of the people that you think aren't ready might be ready tomorrow. The fact is, from this parable, we learn there's different states of readiness. Some are hardened right now. Some are shallow, but at least they're there. Some are distracted, Jesus said literally, by the worries of life and the lure of wealth. But again, they're there. Maybe instead of judging them for this distraction, we should be encouraging them in their growth. And some are receptive. 
That was week one. Week two, we jumped ahead. Out to This is the one that came from Matthew 25. And the parable of the, the laborers that, that got hired different times of the day, they all got paid the same. You go, that's not fair. Uh, God's grace isn't about fair. It's about being extended to everyone. And you can choose it or you can resist it. It's another one of those uh, examples of our choice. Then we went back to Matthew 13. We got the parable of the weeds. We are planted in the world to grow there, we said. This is like seven sermons in two minutes. You don't have to go to church until August now. Uh, we're planted in that world, but the weeds are growing there too. And you know what we said? Jesus knows it. It's his story. He said, yep, the evil one did that. There's, good, there's lots of great wheat. There's some weeds in there. Don't sweat it. We'll take care of that. You just focus on being the best wheat you can be. Uh, let them grow together. Uh, then we uh, continued in Matthew 13 with the parable of mustard seed, the smallest seed known to the biggest plant. And again, what our faith and trust in the gospel being true can be multiplied way beyond what we might think or imagine. God is amazing. He has amazing plans for us. Uh, the smallest seed of the biggest plant. Next one was the, the, the two parables in one day, the parable of the buried treasure and the pearl. And the point was, when you get the gospel, it's that buried treasure. Whoa, I'm going to sell everything I got and buy this field, and then I get that box. I don't, know why, I don't know why I didn't just pick up the treasure and walk away with it. That's another story. Uh, but he bought the field. And then the merchant, actually looking for that pearl, found the most incredible pearl ever, sold everything to get it. So the bottom line, when you really get the gospel, it's worth everything you've got. Of course, you'd want to dive in and do what the Father is asking you to the parable of the two sons. You'd want to obey. It's worth it. Nothing compares. Uh, next one was the parable of talents two weeks ago. Stewardship is about faithfully developing and using our time, treasure, and talents. So again, obedience to God is not a drudgery. It's just developing and using everything he's given us. What could be more fun than that? Go, God made me do this. I'm in. It's cool. It's awesome. Then last week, the parable of the forgiving, uh, unforgiving servant, uh, the one forgiven a whole bunch and turned around and didn't forgive the person that owed him just a little bit. Uh, the bottom line is we're forgiven of much. We are forgiven of much. And we need, need to forgive much. So there you go. There's a series in three minutes and 12 seconds. The parable of two sons. I want you to focus on the question that Jesus asked. So think back to after the two sons. One said he'd do it, and he didn't. The other said, uh, I mean, the one said he wouldn't do it, and he did. And the second one said he would do it, then he didn't. He said, which, the question was, which of the two obeyed the father? Because the bottom line, God will work through those who are obedient to him. And for whatever reason, A, once I landed on the two sons, just that sentence, again, it's a question of Jesus. I think he would ask us, are you obedient? And, uh, and some of you have a little knee-jerk reaction to that. I, I grew up in a very fundamentalist kind of background. And maybe the, there's too much pressure on obeying because you have to obey. Instead of obeying because it's an opportunity to obey, it's an opportunity to have a positive life and be everything God created you to be. It's the same difference, but a very significant difference in the spin. So I just wanted to live in this word as we close out today with a top 10 list of words in Scripture that say obey. There's hundreds. Uh, in, in Deuteronomy 6 alone, where we start, I think I have over 300 cross-references written in the margin of that page. It's the most written on page in my Bible. So I think this verse is important. In Deuteronomy 6, 17, says this. You must diligently obey. I love diligently, really carefully pay attention to the details to do what's right. Not accidentally, not occasionally, not Sunday for an hour and see you again next week. No, diligently, be all about, be all in. You must diligently obey the commands of the Lord your God. All the laws and decrees he has given you, do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so all will go well with you. Do what is right Jesus said, John the Baptist told you the right way to live. He wasn't making that up. It was in the Old Testament. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so all will go well with you. It's going to be best for you. Believe this. 
I'm not trying to cram something on your throat. I'm giving you an incredible opportunity. Obey God the creator. It's going to work out. Trust me. Completely different spin than trying to cram something on your throat. So all, that's Old Testament. I'm free of the Old Testament. I live by the New Testament. Well, good for you. Let's see what Jesus said in the New Testament. Matthew 5, 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I am all about the law. It was good. It was an opportunity. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Jesus said, if I could be slang, <laughs> my dad knew what he was talking about. God's laws are good, and it will go well with you, exactly what the Old Testament said, if you follow them. Right here, this right here in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. So if you ignore the least of these commandments and teach others to do the same, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But if anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven, anyone who obeys God's laws will be called great. Hey, what do you obey? <laughs> I don't know if we applaud that enough in people. We see them, you are doing what God's asking you to do. That's awesome. You'll be called great. Uh, later in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7, Jesus goes on to say this, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but they're really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. What you do is more important than what you say you're going to do. You, you, you know these wolves by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from thistles? Answer is No. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. There goes on to say this. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit. Chase has talked to someone about gardening and stuff that he's not good at. I might be worse. I had a garden once. I mowed it. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Give up. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Now, again, it's not your actions that earn your salvation. It's not your actions you have to do. But it's a celebration of the fact if you choose the good, choose to obey, people notice. That's what that says. There is a good way. Then uh, later on in Matthew 7... One more time, this is the, the last four verses in the chapter. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, other translations say obey, hear my word and obey it is wise. That's the smartest thing you're going to do. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes and torrents, the floodwaters rise, the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. What gives you that bedrock foundation? Listening and obeying. On the other hand, anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it'll collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus' words kind of sounds like he thinks we should obey and that it's wise to obey. Doing the right thing that he suggests you do will not disappoint. It will go well with you. All the phrases we've heard. Uh, he also said in John 14, if you love me, who's he talking to here? Just the disciples in the upper room. Just the gang. He said, if you love me, obey my commands. Chapter 15, he talks about the vine and branches. Towards the end of that down, verses 12-ish, says the same thing again. Repeats it in the same little chat with the guys up in the room right before he goes to be crucified. One of the most important things he said, do what you say you're going to do. Do what I've asked you to do. It'll go well with you. You don't have to apologize for it. Don't be afraid of it. Just do it. Uh, and then one more thing, last, his last words. After the crucifixion, about 40 days later, we know he met the disciples in Galilee. Matthew 28, the last verses in Matthew, his last, among his last words. Therefore, Go make disciples of all the nations. 
Don't apologize for following me. Go tell everybody about how great it is. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, these new disciples, to what? Obey all the commands I've given you. If you love me, obey me. Make disciples. Tell them to obey me. We, get, we gotta get away from obey being a bad, pushy word and being a celebrating opportunity word. We're not just left in the dark when we choose to follow Jesus. He gives us the directions. All we have to do is do it. And if Jesus isn't enough for you, it should be, <laughs> but the New Testament goes on. Let's check out Paul first. In the book of Romans, he's writing these guys. He hasn't met them yet. He ends up being in Rome. He's not there yet. So he's writing this letter, trying to encourage them in the faith. He says, well, then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? That we don't have to obey? We can do what we want? <laughs> God, God will forgive me, right? Well, I know I shouldn't do this, but God will forgive me. I've heard people say that. And it's true. But it shouldn't encourage you to go do something bad. <laughs> go, oh man, it's Wednesday. I haven't sinned yet. Let's go. <laughs> that, that's craziness, isn't it? And it's, but it's exactly how some of us live sometimes. It says, of course not. Don't you realize you become the slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Paul chatting with the Romans. I'm going to go on to, uh, is there a second slide of that? Sorry. No, there's not. So Peter and John address it too. Two of the key inner circle, Peter, James, and John, right? The three inside guys. Peter starts his letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, right at the beginning. Celebrating with followers of Jesus what it's been like to be on this journey. Uh, shortly after he was, he was crucified, he requested it to be upside down because he didn't, he didn't feel worthy to die like Jesus. Incredible story. But before that happened, he says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy. You aren't holy by yourself. You're a little messed up, right? <laughs> but God makes us holy. So as a result, you have obeyed him. Paul celebrates that a group of people in a, in a really tough time. Roman Empire wasn't a pretty place always. You think we have our problems. They had their problems. And he says, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. God's changed your life. Wow, that's awesome. It wasn't a negative thing to obey. He's changed you. And then John, he wrote his letters, he wrote the gospel, obviously, but first, second, third John, late in his life, chapter three, he said, we'll receive from him whatever we ask for because we obey him and do the things that please him. What you do is much more important than what you say you're gonna do. So you have it top to bottom, all through scripture. And I said hundreds of more times. Writers acknowledge the fact that God knows what he's doing, and you're going to be better off if you obey. But I think the real clincher is here. Philippians chapter 2. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to, be, to cling to. I just love the, the, the picture of the day in heaven God called the cabinet together. He said, I got a new idea. We got to get people's attention down there. I love them, and they're ignoring me. Uh, Jesus, I think you're going down. And, and people immediately said, what, what's that going to be like? You know, we're going to get like 10,000 angels together, and he's going to have a big white horse, and he's going to ride into Jerusalem and rear back, you know, Lone Ranger mask. What, what's this going to be like? And God goes, oh, no, not anything like that. Um, he's going as a baby. A, ba a human. He's going as a human. <laughs> baby. Helpless. He's going to be born in a barn. You know, your parents are like, what are you, born in a barn? I, Jesus' mom didn't ask him that question. <laughs> <laughs> Though he was God, he didn't cling to that. When God, whatever brought that plan, he said, I I'll do it. And he willingly, and this is how it's celebrated in Philippians 2, God, uh, he did not think of equality with God as something to, to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. I was God, now I'm going to be a human. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. A criminal's death on a cross. He humbled himself to obedience to God. God, the son himself, obedient to God. And after Paul kind of drops that bomb in Philippians and has a great little poetic 
next several verses of the every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He then addresses obedience, I think, in one of the coolest ways. I think it's verse 13, says this. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. For God is working in you. Go back to that quick, please. Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Think of uh, a coaching illustration. Because God is at work. But how is it? He's really coaching you. It might be from a sermon you sit through that kind of resonates with you. Maybe through some book of the Bible. You might be a, some other just Christian author book you're reading about something that you're struggling with. Like, wow, that's exactly what I need to hear. It might be through a conversation over a cup of coffee with a good friend. When you say, you know what? I have this question. And they're actually able to address it. And you go, wow, that makes sense. That was good. There are many, many ways God is at work giving you the desire so I think of coaching, I, I had a, many of you have been in organized sports some way or fashion or coached them. I've done both. Uh, I played uh, junior varsity basketball for Lansing Eastern High School. That's back when it was 2,200 students. And uh, JV then was just sophomores because freshmen were still in junior high. Uh, but made that team, we weren't, we weren't very good. Uh, our coach was not one of those angry, screaming in your face, making you feel terrible about yourself type coaches, though, that they exist. I really don't like them. I think it's because I worked with kids my whole life. I just, I don't think it works. Sorry. If you're one of those, you know, change. Um, <laughs> but my junior varsity, Ron Snyder, coach at Lansing High School, was not one of those. In fact, we had, there was time out third quarter where Eastern was at, we're at ever. We we're getting killed. And, we, you know, so we, he kind of come dragging off the court and, you know, do a little hollow thing. And he looks at us, he goes, kind of smiles, which, I mean, a lot of coaches wouldn't do that when you're down by 20, by, the score is 50 to 25. Ron, <laughs> look at the scoreboard, goes, well, at first he goes, what do you, what's wrong, guys, what are you so down about? He goes, uh, we're only down by 25, he looked up the scoreboard, <laughs> he goes, and that's all we have. <laughs> so in that moment, he's smart enough to know, you know what, we're not going to win this game, <laughs> and we didn't, uh, but he took seriously the, the opportunity to give us the desire to keep playing, even if sometimes the game wasn't going our way. And the best coaches somehow are those coaches where you come off the floor, you expect that, an uplifting, positive statement to help you keep going, whether you're winning or losing. And many players will say when they attribute a great coach, Basically, that they trusted them because they knew they had their best interest in mind. And because they trusted the coach, they would, they would run through a wall for him. Because he gave them the desire, but also the power to do their best. I, I think that's a great picture. I, I just don't think God's the coach just yelling and screaming and really mad at you today. Even if you're facing some tough times, you're down by 25. You go, hey, there's teams down by 26. We can do this. <laughs> Take the next step. Play the next game. Stay in the game. And to really trust that God has our best at heart always. He's not just a good coach. He's a perfect coach. And we can trust that God, when he says, this is what you should do, if we obey it, it'll be the best thing we can do. There's an old hymn we sing all the time, one of the, one of the favorites. If, if you did the, uh, we used to do the hymn sings on Sunday nights where you just yell out your favorite. Uh, this is always one of them, trust and obey. And the chorus says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And what I love about that hymn is it blatantly states, you can be happy in Jesus. Following Jesus isn't drudgery. Following Jesus isn't rules. Following Jesus is happy because that's who you, you were created to be. And you can turn to him and say, I trust you, God, that you know best. I want to obey everything you ask me to do. Not out of drudgery, but out of the joy of knowing it's gonna be life in all its fullness, as Jesus said in John 10, 10. So you're gonna read the last statement with me. It's right here. Let's read it. The kingdom of God is here. We actually do, I'm, I'm sorry, I blew it. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Let's start again. <clears throat> Ready, team? The kingdom of God is here. 
what we actually do is more important than what we say we are going to do. So let's just do it. Wow, just do it. That looked good on a t-shirt. I think we're going to do a River's Edge Community Church, just do it. What do you think? <laughs> is that good? Uh, the kingdom of heaven is here. Let's just do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. And then when we start talking about what some people see as rules and regulations, commandments, they put it in such a negative spin. I thank you that you give us guidance in this crazy life of how to best follow you. Heavenly Father, I just pray for your blessing on each one here, each one online this morning, that as we consider where we are at, maybe there's times we've said, yep, I'll do that, and we never get around to doing it. Give us the desire, Father. Then give us the power, the follow-through, to do the things you're asking us to do because we are the ones that will benefit. You only have our best in mind. Help us become that best. And together, Lord, may we become plural, the bests. And just continue to call us to make a difference here in our little neck of the woods here in the West Side of Lansing. We pray your blessing on each one as we continue that journey together. And we'll give you the praise, you the glory and honor for anyone's life who has changed because of this little family we call River's Edge. We pray for your blessing to that end in Jesus' name. Amen.